full note. Uh, if only we had an aroma and taste button on Zoom, uh, we'd enjoy it even more. Um, I'd like to ask you if you have questions to uh, put them in Zoom in the chat box. Um, and when the opportunity arises, I will ask Kathy the questions and I'm sure that she'll be happy to answer them. Uh, we also have something very exciting this evening. After you see this, what she can do, you'll be doubly excited. If there are any uh, non-owners of the food co-op, those who are just thinking about joining, um, if you join this evening, Kathy will make the pie of your choice, or she'll have about 10 choices, maybe 20, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and um, those who want to make a gift membership um, will also be able to get a pie. So this is the season of giving. Um, and so if you are ready to gift one uh, this evening, you will also get a pie. Um, Someone here has known Kathy since the day um, she basically set foot in Fredericksburg, went to the farmer's market, and he will introduce her. And here's Rich La Rochelle. Okay, it's such a pleasure to be introducing Kathy Pekka Malden. Um, she actually grew up on a farm in Washington State, and she comes from a long line of bakers. It's in her DNA, as you'll see tonight. So as uh, Els was saying, we met Kathy actually in June of 2017 at the farmer's market. She and her husband had bought a house in Fredericksburg, but they didn't move here until July. So she joined right on the spot. She had belonged to a food co-op in Pennsylvania and she knew what a food co-op was and the value of it. So she signed up right there at the farmer's market and she has been so supportive ever since. Uh, she volunteered and tabled at the farmer's market and she, um, she participated in both of our capital campaigns as a volunteer in 2019 and 2020, did a fantastic job. She hosted a house party for the co-op where uh, she and others told neighbors and friends about the co-op and, and people joined that night. So that was really exciting and a lot of fun. She's always been supportive and um, it's been a great pleasure to know her. And I follow her on Facebook and I see the incredible baked goods that she produces. And so I suggested to the events committee, let's get her to see if she'll show us how to, how to bake a beautiful pie. So it's such a pleasure and treat to have you with us tonight, Kathy. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Rich. And, and I see Gloria's on tonight. I think like the day after I joined, I got a email from Gloria and we had coffee within 24 hours and she was signing me up for all kinds of things because no one ever says no to Gloria. So that was great. Um, as Rich said, I, you know, I've been baking for a long time. I love to bake. Um, my grandmother was a, she, I called her a pastry chef one time and she laughed at me. She was a pie baker at the Depot Bar and Grill in Twin Falls, Idaho. And I think her record was 60 pies in one day during the state fair. She was about 4'10" about 90 pounds, and she had such big biceps that when we bought her shirts, we had to buy them big and take them in in the body because she rolled all of her pie crust out by hand. So, so I have a lot to live up to in, in the, the genetic category. So we only have an hour. I have a lot I want to talk to you about. So we're going to get started with crust because everybody gets like scared of pie crust. At least that's what I, my friends tell me. And it is fine to buy a refrigerated pie crust, but once you learn how to make your own, you probably will never go back. And this recipe was handed down to me from my Aunt Jo, who was a phenomenal baker. And she decided I was ready. And she wrote it on the back of one of her bank deposit slips, sometime I think in the 1970s. And that's what I keep in my recipe box. So you never know how you're going to get a recipe, where it's going to come from, and what it's going to be written on. But I think those are the best kind. So her recipe for um, pie crust. Um, is fairly high fat ratio, but it works really well. So I have a cup of flour here with a teaspoon of salt. And then the proportions are 50% shortening to the amount of flour. So about a cup of flour, so I have a half a cup of shortening. And I like to cut it with a knife, just kind of into little squares first. The idea is to coat the fat, and some people use butter, you know, whatever works for you. 
Um, we're going to talk about my friend Carolyn a little bit later, and she swears by butter flavored Crisco, but I don't like unnatural flavor, so I don't use that. But so you cut it up a little bit. The idea is to get all the little fat pieces kind of coated in flour so that when um, the pie crust bakes, that's what makes it flaky. So there's science here too. And then I just use an old fashioned pastry cutter. Some people like to make pie crust in a food processor and you can do that. You put it in on the, sometimes there's a plastic blade that comes with it and you pulse it a few times until it kind of forms a ball. And that's perfectly fine. I just like the feeling of doing it by hand and kind of watching it and seeing how all the little pieces are coming together. And so you kind of just mush it around a little bit until it looks kind of like bisquick, you know, if you ever use that. Or one other way to tell if it's kind of ready is pick up a little piece of it, sort of sticks together, but it crumbles, it's ready. And then here's the family secret part of this pie crust. So in most pie crust recipes, at this point, you'll be um, told to sprinkle a tablespoon at a time of ice water across your fat and flour and salt and mix it together very thoroughly with the fork. But my Aunt Joanne has a different idea. And her recipe calls for half a can of evaporated milk. So it's not a vegan pie crust. If you want a vegan pie crust, you, do, you have to do the ice water. Um, she would normally just dump the whole thing in, but it can be a little finicky depending on the humidity. And since today's kind of a humid day, I'm gonna put a little in at a time and just mix it till it comes together. I have been known to follow her and dump the whole thing in, then have to add more flour because it was too gooby. So you just kind of mix it together. You don't want to overwork your pie crust. And then one of my little secrets for rolling it out successfully is you make a little hockey puck out of it, wrap it up good in plastic wrap, and stick it in the fridge. And it's a miracle. It's already refrigerated. So you can stick it in for an hour at least is good. Um, overnight is great. If you're in a real hurry, you can roll it out. While it's not refrigerated, it's just going to take a little extra flour. And so you might get frustrated. It tears more easily. Then when you're ready to roll it, I just leave it on the plastic. I get another sheet of plastic wrap. Sprinkle just a little bit of flour on that, kind of over the surface. Put that down on top of my hockey puck press. Push it out a little bit. And then my rolling pin. So the rolling pin is really important. You want something really heavy so you don't have to work so hard. This one, and elves will laugh at me because if you know me, you know, like I have like 8 million stories. So I have a story for everything. So where I grew up in Eastern Washington state, it's all farms. And there are many farming communities um, that are similar to the Amish, but not Amish. One of them is the Huterite community. They're probably more like Mennonites, if you're familiar with the Mennonite traditions. But there's a fairly large um, settlement of Huterites in the, in the Columbia River Valley where I grew up. And my mom was very good friends with a lot of the Huterite ladies. And they would do quilting together and they would come and pick berries at my parents' place. And so I think, I'm trying to think when it was, it might've been my college graduation. I'm trying to think, but I got this beautiful handmade wooden rolling pin made handmade and, and milled by the Huterite in Washington that my mom uh, bought for me from them, had made for me. And so it's what I always use to roll everything out. Um, you don't have a rolling pin, you can put water in a wine bottle as long as you have a, hopefully a screw top one. So there's lots of things, people use marble ones. Sometimes people want to make making pie crust harder than it has to be. So they'll tell you, oh, you have to have a marble or glass rolling pin so that you can put it in your freezer and it's very cold and everything has to be super chilled. And, you know, it probably works for some people, but 
I think of my grandmother in the restaurant making 60 pies a day and think of how she would laugh if I told her she had to get a marble rolling pin and put it in the refrigerator before she rolled out each crust. She used to also make um, great big slabs of, of oatmeal cookies in a jelly roll pan it set on the counter in the diner. And so I asked her for her recipe once when I was like in high school. And she sent it to me and it said, 25 pounds of flour. And <laughs> uh, Grandma, I don't think I'm going to be making, you know, pie for the restaurant but, or cookies for the restaurant. Um, this is going to be the bottom crust of an apple pie. So I just stick my hand in it, flip it over as fast as I can, and kind of move it in place. The nice thing about the bottom crust, it doesn't have to be perfect. This one could have probably been a little bigger because you can mush it into place with your fingers. I'm going to put a, I'm going to put what I call a, cheat, a cheater's lattice on this one. So I have a regular lattice on one that I made yesterday where you weave the straight strips in and out and it's pretty and very time consuming. But if you don't have a lot of time to do a lattice, there is a way to do one that looks pretty nice and doesn't take as much time. But we're going to try that one today. So we'll get this crust in place. So another story about my Aunt Joanne, who, whose pie crust recipe this is, is that she would sometimes just feel like baking pies. And so she would go to her kitchen, and she was a, a telephone business office supervisor. So she worked full time her whole life. But on the weekend, she'd get into a pie baking mood, and she might turn out 15 or 20 pies and then put them in a little cart and just go around her neighborhood and deliver them to her neighbors, just for fun, just because. And so she used to collect Marie Callender pie tins that she could afford to give away and not worry about uh, missing. So I wear a, some of you have seen often, I wear a, a nickel and a chain around my neck and it's from her funeral as a reminder to all of us to be as generous as she was because when we were kids, every time we saw her, she gave us all a nickel. So at her funeral, we all got nickels to remember her by. So that's, you know, about as good as it's going to get. So I pre-sliced the apples um, because otherwise we could have watched me slice apples all night. So this is where my friend Carolyn comes in. My friend Carolyn lives on a 50-acre horse farm in Geauga County, Ohio. And Carolyn has won the blue ribbon for apple pie at the Ohio State Fair so many times that they finally barred her from entering for a few years so that somebody else could have a chance. So I bugged her and bugged her and bugged her. She finally let me watch her make a pie. And her secret is, now she uses butter flavored Crisco in her crust, but her secret is three different kinds of apples. It has to be three different kinds. And it doesn't matter what they are as long as one is golden delicious. So one has to be golden delicious. The other two can be whatever you can. I've used uh, golden delicious, Empire, and um, what's the other one? Oh, uh, Granny Smith, because I like a little bit of tartness. So you can, you know, the amount kind of depends on the size of your pan, how full you like your pies. This one's not going to be super mounded, so we're going to use the cheater lattice. So that looks pretty good. The other thing Carolyn does, which is very different, is, and you can mix this in the bowl if you want, but she just sprinkles the sugar and cinnamon mixture over the pies in the shell. Actually, what Carolyn does is slice her apples directly into the shell. She doesn't even bother with the bowl. But by doing it, her, her view is if you do it this way, the juice is that the apples that the sugar draws out of the apples, stay in the pie and get reabsorbed and don't just collect on the bottom of the bowl and make your, your pie crust soggy if you pour it in there. So I don't know. I don't want to argue with the like 25 time winner of the Ohio State Blue Ribbon for apple pie. So we're going to go with Carolyn. So the cheater lattice. I have another crust that I've already rolled out and chilled. 
And if we were doing a normal lattice, we would just cut it into strips and weave them over the top of the pie. But if you're rushed for time, I think there's a picture, one of my Facebook pictures has this on it. You can just cut squares. They don't have to be super neat or all the same size or anything. And you just kind of, you want to make it sort of flat and you just kind of build a little bit of patchwork on top of the pie, leaving some gaps because a good lattice crust always has the spaces in between so the steam can get out. But you can do it free form. You can, if you're like super neat, you can do it very geometrical. I kind of have done it both ways. It depends on what mood I'm in at the time. But today we're kind of looking like we're going free form. Make sure you peel it off the plastic. Plastic wrap is usually not a great addition to a pie. Else, do we have any questions while I'm finishing this? I just got one. How much sugar and cinnamon in one apple pie? So that's a great question. And it, the answer is, it depends on how sweet your apples are and your own taste. So I use, in this pie, I have, it's probably, eight or nine apples because they were small. And I used a half a cup of sugar and a teaspoon of cinnamon. Thank you. I also would like to tell everyone that the uh, recipes will be posted uh, probably on Facebook, uh, maybe this evening even, or otherwise tomorrow. On and I will include the pie Facebook page, page, which I forgot to include. Yep. So Elle was helping me out today. Elle was helping me. She thought I forgot the pie crust recipe. <laughs> she found one for me very nicely, and I'm sure it's great. So, you know, whatever you have left here, you just kind of fit in. And we do have an. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We have another question here. Those who are environmentally conscious, can we use beeswax cloths instead of? Uh, plastic oh, wrap. Sure. Absolutely. Whatever, whatever works for you. Yes. And I actually need to order some and start doing that myself. Thank you for the reminder. I've never tried yeah. it, but I'm sure it would work extremely well. I do as a, my little guilty secret though, is I do tend to save these, use them for a few pies, but then eventually they do get tossed. So that's not the best. All right, here so, is another uh, question that I need to answer here. Yes, it will be on the Food Co-op's uh, Facebook page. Uh, the other thing you can use maybe, I don't know, uh, would that be parchment paper? It might be a little crinkly, but you know what I'm thinking? Maybe you could even use, especially if you dampened it a little bit, a really, really thin tea towel. Like this is like a super thin one, which I really like. I'll have to experiment with that. I think that's a great question. Okay, thank you. So another thing my friend Carolyn does is makes that I learned from her is makes pie crust little pie crust decorations for her pies. So her signature when she makes her pies for the fair or whatever else. And in Geauga County, anytime there's a fundraiser, they always auction off one of Carolyn's pies, and it goes for like astronomical amounts of money. So, but I can't steal her roses from her. So this is. My little decoration I usually put on my apple pies. These are whole cloves, and I just roll a little apple out of pie dough. I stick one clove in the end, and it looks like, hopefully, the yep, end of an apple. We can see it. And then the other one goes in the top, and it becomes the stem. So you throw your little apple, like in the middle of your pie. You can make two or three, whatever you want. And then, what did I do with that? I had a little egg wash ready. I think it might be in my other bread. Hang on one second. My egg wash appears to be hiding from me, but 
if I had it out, it's just an egg um, beaten with a teaspoon of water and just a tiny little pinch of salt. Just use a pastry brush, brush it over the top. Um, and then I like to sprinkle just a little bit of sugar, just to kind of caramelize a little bit, and just give a little extra um, to the pie. So the, um, the double pressed pies typically go in the oven at a higher temperature first. So I'm putting it in at 425. And it'll go in for 15 minutes at that temperature. Then we'll knock it down to 375 and finish baking it. So any questions on Annie Joe's famous pie crust? Um, not so much the pie crust, but is there no butter in the filling is the question. There isn't. Um, and sometimes if you want to, I'm kind of trying to be a little cholesterol conscious, especially with the fat content of the crust. But you can dot butter on the apples before you put the top crust on if you want it to be a little bit richer. Thank so you. Sometimes I do that. Okay, so the next one we're going to make is really easy. I'm so proud of myself. This is my my ode to knees and block for pie baking. Uh, the question while you're getting ready is how long, how long at 375 degrees for the apple pie? Um, well, 15 at 425 and then about another 20 to 30, depends on the pie. You kind of watch the crust and, and take a look. I also, um, at the end of the first 15, I usually throw a little um, crust protector on top so that the crusts don't get too brown. While the rest, but I have a couple of metal ones. Um, here. They'll fit on the smaller pan. And this is a nice silicone one that can fit on a bunch of different sizes of pans. Thank you. So this pie is called uh, a Washington nut pie. And it's similar to a pecan pie, but it's made with walnuts, which is run in Washington State. So I gotta melt the butter. is pretty much the only thing I use my microwave for. So this filling calls for three eggs. Better if you can to leave your eggs to come to room temperature before you put them in your baked goods. Um, you know, again, it depends on the time that you have and if you remember. I'm gonna kill it if you don't. Um, a cup of dark caro syrup. I know there's a cup in here because I used half of it yesterday a cup of white sugar. You can also use light caro syrup and brown sugar if you want. Um, I think it's a half, half a teaspoon of salt, whatever the recipe says, a teaspoon of vanilla. We mix that together really well. And then we put a cup of um, shelled walnut. And I love this pie. It's served in restaurants in my home state, especially in Eastern Washington where there's a lot of walnut trees. And my dad had a really good friend with a walnut grove. And every late summer, early fall, he'd go to his friend and he would, he would um, basically glean the walnuts that hadn't been harvested that were still on the ground and still good. And then sell them all for me and other people. But I always got a care package of freshly harvested Washington walnuts for my holiday baking. And I miss a lot of things about my dad. And that's, that, that is a major one. Because it was I would bake stuff and then send it back to him. So the nut pie goes in a pre-lined, you know, a, a, pie, a pie pan that you lined with pastry, not baked, raw pastry. I like to roll them out and refrigerate them. Um, I think when you put them in the oven, it tends to hold the crust a little bit together. And just pour that in there. And 
Now this one is baked at 325 for about 45 minutes. So you want to keep checking it. You don't want to overbake it and you don't want to um, bake it at too high of a temperature because it needs to create that nice gooey center. Um, you, when you look at it, you might think it's not done because it's still kind of gooey, but you put a really slim bladed knife uh, into it mm -hmm. and it comes out clean. It's done even though it's jiggly and then it will come together like this magic one that has just come from my oven yesterday. Mm -hmm. And if you can see, we did a little pie crust um, decoration on that. Just I made um, walnuts. So just rolled a little extra pie dough, the shape of a walnut, scored it with my paring knife, painted a little vanilla on it, and baked it. And then threw it on top of the Washington nut pie. It's almost um, a crime not to eat that pie with vanilla ice cream or whipped cream or something really creamy, um, coconut ice cream, something would be really good with that. Now, um, this I've might be, Kathy, this might be a really difficult question. <laughs> Are there vegan substitutes for any of this? I was just going to say that I've never tried this pie, but um, I think, and I probably will do some experimentation, um, either aquafaba or one of the vegan egg substitutes would probably be worth to try. There's so much flavor in here from the nuts and the cinnamon and, and nutmeg and, and everything else that were in that spice mix that I threw in that um, it really does um, come across very flavorful. So I think I, it would be a textural issue. So I'll have to do some experimentation and see what happens. I will let you know, All right. but for now, it's, it's a lacto-ovo vegetarian pie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, any other questions? Um, no, but people are liking your kitchen. Oh, I like my kitchen too. <laughs> I have to tell you. So I went, my mother um, passed away in 2014 before I lived in this house. And I wish, I would have loved to have shown her my kitchen um, because she was a phenomenal cook. And for the first 12 years of her married life, from the time that I was six, well, no. So the first couple years she lived on a, the first year she was on a marine base in California. But when I was six months old, my parents moved to the farm that they basically homesteaded in Eastern Washington. They had a program for veterans where they could claim a section of un, previously unfarmed land. So they did that. They moved on to a 160 acre section they lived in the front half of a of my dad's machine shed where he that he built to store his tractors and her kitchen consisted of a sink like a like maybe a two by two feet by four feet little i don't know counter made out of two by fours probably a refrigerator and a range and that's where she turned out all of this amazing stuff for until i was 12 and we moved um to a different farm with an actual farmhouse which was a shock so she would be um, astonished by this kitchen and I would probably never get her out of it. So I, I do regret that. Can I ask another question here? Um, sure. Someone asked, do you not need to uh, pre-bake the pie shell? And I think it's the not previous for, question. Yeah, not for these pies. Um, if, you have a, if you have a feeling that you want to cook with the pie, then you don't pre-bake the pie shell. For um, certain cream pies, like a chocolate cream pie or a banana cream pie, where that you make the custard on the stove, and then you fill the shell and it just it just chills, then you would would blind bake or pre bake the pie shell, and and in that case you just stick it all over with little with the fork to make lots of little holes in the bottom so that the steam can get out. Um, you can also put a round of parchment paper and put pie weight, or I you know some people use you know other other kinds of, of weights, but I have a string of pie weights here somewhere, but um, but that's only when the, the filling itself is already cooked before it hits the crust. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Lemon meringue pie, yeah. So the next one is, um, 
you could use pumpkin for this. I'm using sweet potato. Here's another story, I'm warning you. So this might look to you like a very ugly sweet potato that you would probably pass by at Wegman. But this is a very special sweet potato, as are the sweet potatoes that are in my pie because I grew this sweet potato. In my little garden allotment, I have a, a spot in the community garden in Fredericksburg, which is um, up off of Kenmore uh, by the canal path. And um, this year I decided to try to grow sweet potatoes. I've never grown them before. My dad grew potatoes commercially and in his garden. My dad, in his later years, uh, my parents uh, lived on just three acres. And my father had every single inch of that three acres planted in something and if you came to visit you were going to get a tour of every single inch of what was planted he had the most amazing berry garden strawberry red raspberry blackberries um, there's a picture I think on the flyer for this of a couple of blackberry pies on the counter in my parents farmhouse um, I went out I, I tried in, in the last few years I tried to always I usually went a couple times a year but I tried to always go late summer early fallish um, to be there for harvest and to help and also just to eat. And um, I'd gotten there really late. And because I sometimes I flew into Seattle and drove the 200 miles depending on, you know, but so my dad wakes me up and he's coming in the kitchen. He has two big buckets full of blackberries. And my father was your typical Western farmer kind of guy, like a few words, well chosen, you know, very and he brings these berries in and he called me sis. And he goes, he goes, sis, come here. And he sets them down in front of me and he looks at me and he says, pie. That's it. So a couple hours later, we had those two blackberry pies that were that were there for him. <laughs> so, and I would give anything to bake a blackberry pie for him now. But we lost him, um, it'll be two years in February. And I was privileged to be with him and spent the last five days of his life with him. He made the decision on his own to um, stop the treatment that he was getting for a, a very aggressive form of leukemia at that point. He was 87. And, you know, like all good Western stoic farmers, he went out on his own terms. So, but he uh, certainly left me with a legacy of a love for food. My, my brother and sister and I always laughed this whole kind of fancy farm to table like movement. We're like, well, I mean, what's that? That's, isn't that the way everybody eats? You pick it and you eat it. So, apparently not. So anyway, um, the rest of my story, my sweet potatoes. So I planted these sweet potatoes in my, my plot and the vines went crazy, of course. And so la a week ago, Saturday, uh, well, I'd been harvesting along, but I went and I thought I had harvested all of them. I, all the ones I could see, I dug and they were all a little homely, but beautiful on the inside. And so last Saturday, I went up there to kind of to continue cleaning up and I was cleaning out the vines. I have a new puppy. And he's 11 months old. He's upstairs trying to be good. Um, he's a corgi. And he goes to the garden with me. And he jumped in the garden. And we started digging like crazy. And I thought, oh, no. He found more sweet potatoes. So he showed me. There were some that were so deep under the ground that I hadn't seen them. He found another 20 pounds of sweet potatoes that I would have just let rot in the ground. So I had no idea they were there. And he was, like, so proud of himself. So... This is Cecil's pie because he found the potatoes. So um, the recipe that I put, that you'll see calls for the sweet potatoes to be cubed and boiled so that they get really, really soft. I was doing a lot of them. So I just, um, and I don't want to peel them raw. So I just cut them in half the long way and uh, sprayed a little cooking spray on a, on a sheet pan and baked them in a low oven, not roasted. I didn't want them to get crispy. Um, and then I put a pan of water in the oven so that the oven was really humid. So they stayed really, really soft until they got soft enough to, to puree. And then you can mash them with the potato masher. You can buzz them up in your, sweet, in your um, food processor. You can use a fork, whatever. The texture is going to be different. I um, did these with a hand blender because they were pretty soft. So that's the sweet potato puree that Cecil found for us all. And then you use two eggs. And again, I'm going to have to experiment with the egg-free version of this. Um, oh, you know what? I did that wrong. That is OK. 
I'm so busy telling you my stories, I forgot I didn't do this right. So in this one, the egg and the butter and the sugar get creamed together before you put it in with the puree. It probably really wouldn't matter that much, but you could do this with a mixer. Um, I can, I'm kind of lazy and I have to haul all the equipment out, so I tend to try to do as much by hand as I can just because I enjoy it. But if I'm doing a lot more, if I'm doing several, then I might. Okay, that's the cue to turn the oven down. Okay, we're down to 375. I'm going to take a peek and see if it needs a little cover. Actually, it doesn't because it doesn't really have a big rim. So that'll go for another 20. And we'll check it. All right, back to my sugar and butter, sweet potato pie. Let's cream that good. Throw in vanilla. This is um, a teaspoon, I think, of cinnamon um, and a little bit of salt. And this recipe calls for nutmeg. And I think it makes a huge difference if you grate your own. So I use a little microplane and a whole nutmeg, which you can buy at the grocery store. The jar cut and you meal last your whole life because this little nutmeg pod lasts forever. Um, if you want to be like really scientific, you can you know, grate it into something else and measure it. I kind of just eyeball it. It calls for like half a teaspoon. So I, you know, just put it in there. I've done some earlier, so I'll throw that in there. While, you, while you're doing that, there is a question about, I think that's the pie that's in the oven. What if the lattice gets too dark? Is that a risk or? The, the the either one either way well if you you should your lattice should be about the same thickness as the top crust so it really shouldn't I mean you should really um it should be the same as the top crust it's no no more risky of getting overbaked than it's just a regular round top crust the only thing the lattice if you have if you just put a round on it you've got to cut split for the steam to get out so it's just a you know different something. I, there's certain types, like I think a blackberry pie always has to have a lattice just because the color is so pretty. But if you don't have time, you don't have time. So, and then let's just mix up the sweet potato mixture here. If I could find my whisk, I would use it it's somewhere. And then this will get poured in another pie crust that's already made. And I think I have to check the recipe on the baking time for this one. I can't exactly remember. But through the magic of television, it comes out of the oven. And two decorations that I like for sweet potato pies. I like to put little mini marshmallows around the edge because it's like reminds me of the old fashioned Thanksgiving sweet potatoes with the marshmallows on top. And then I made out of pie crust, I just freehand cut my version of a sweet potato vine, the great big leaf and the vine, just for fun, sugared it and then baked it. Now the fun part of this, this is the one my kids really like, is taking your culinary torch. You can run this under a broiler if you want to, if you don't have a torch. I have to get my torch to work. And just hit the tops of the marshmallows till they blacken a little bit, caramelize a little bit. How far away are you from Oh, about an inch and a half. And I kind of try to hit it on the outside a little bit too. Okay. 
blow off the ones that are on fire. All right. I think we have and someone who wants food. that one for Christmas. Okay. That's, you know, <laughs> all we have to do is buy somebody a present. Um, the kids love this one, and this makes a nice presentation on a, you know, a holiday buffet or, you know, something like that. So. So then I have one more. I'm not going to make it, but I do. I have it pre-made. It's um, a little bit more intricate than some of the other ones. This is a cranberry sage pie. It smells really, really good. It just has some leaves on it, and it's kind of a big cranberry. Um, for this one, you do need a food processor. It makes it easier. It has um, dried cranberries that you rehydrate in boiling water, fresh cranberries, some of which are roughly chopped in your food processor. And you also use the food processor to chop up fresh sage leaves with sugar and some other seasonings to make a nice, uh, uh, the seasoning sugar mixture. And then mix the fresh cranberries, some of them chopped, some of them whole, the dried cranberries, the sage and sugar mixture. And then it's a double crust pie, which gets the same treatment um, as the apple pie, baked at a higher temperature for 15 or 20 minutes and then finished at the lower temperature. So that's the pie repertoire today. I'm actually surprised I got through this all in 45 minutes. Maybe I should have had all the cranberry stuff out to make too. But. So no, this was beautiful. This is beautiful. If there are any questions, uh, we got a very impressive here on the chat. Um, hold on, I've got another one here. Uh, oh, someone's saying what to use. Yeah. Oh, applesauce for eggs or banana. Oh, that's good. I'm going to give that a try. I have all those things. Excellent. Quarter cup of applesauce or mashed banana. Everybody can read this. So um, maybe if um, this is being recorded, if we can save the chat as well, people can look at that uh, for those who mm -hmm. look for it. And of course, you can make the pie crust um, baked with vegetable shortening, not butter. And you can use ice water. And then it, it's a vegan pie crust. And it's a good, it doesn't have sugar in it. So it's also, I use that same recipe for my savory pies, like chicken pot pie or turkey pie or any kind of meat pie, you can still use that, that same basic um, pie crust recipe. Right. Well, not everybody here is vegan, so it's... Um, right. Ours won't be. So I know Andy is taking notes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so here we have some... Ah, someone says, I wish I hadn't already joined Then I could join now to get a pie. But we can tell her that if she buys someone a gift ownership, well, I'm sort of a she pie will get a too, pie. So if somebody really needs a pie for the holidays, you know, hit me up. <laughs> Talking to you, Adam. Kathy, question. What is your favorite pie? Oh, really good question. So here's another story. So my little grandmother, Tilly, the Every, I'm the Tilly of the next generation because I'm the next shortest one. Like when you grew up past Grandma Tilly, that was like a rite of passage when you got taller than her. Now for the kids in the next, I'm it. If you get taller than Aunt Kathy, you're now, you know, you've grown. Um, but when all of, we'd go visit her and she would say to all of the grandkids, okay, what's your favorite pie? And our mothers would take us aside and try to convince us all to say the same thing. Like just say apple or just say pumpkin, whatever. And we were like, no. So my brother would always say pumpkin. My sister would always say hers. chocolate, I think. And I would always say cherry as a kid. And then whatever else my cousin said, at the end of the day, we would all have our own pie of whatever <laughs> flavor we wanted. So cherry was it as a child. Um, now, I think blackberry, probably, if I could have the good berries like I, like I could get um, from the, the farm. I also like the, the root vegetable pies, the pumpkin. You could make this sweet potato pie with pumpkin with um, a hard squash butternut. I did it once with butternut and apple puree, and it was, it was kind of nice. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I like all kinds of pies. Um, I made one one year. I got fancy and made a an eggnog cream pie with a, an eggnog flavored meringue, which was, which was a lot of fun. And there's a recipe that was on the flyer uh, for a salted caramel pie. It came from the same bakery that this cranberry recipe came. And it's a really good pie. It's just really complicated to do on something because you have to make a fresh batch of caramel on the stove and 
use the candy thermometer and all that kind of stuff. But basically you make the, they use a butter crust, you fill it in its raw apples also, and then you make the fresh caramel and pour it into the pie. And, and it's really, really good. Um, I like that mm -hmm. one a lot too. So that sounds good. I, I guess it's like my kids don't ask me which one's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, the accolades are coming in saying how beautiful and how wonderful and what an artist you are. Um, no, and we agree. We agree. This was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for taking time to do this. It's something that I absolutely love to do. Um, you know, just when I've had a bad day, even if, it, you know, now, now I'm working from home, so it's not so much a bad commute, but if I can come into the kitchen and make something that's going to make somebody smile, it just makes everything better. All right, hold on. There's more coming in here. Somebody wants to know, what are you going to do with all those pies tonight? Okay, so here's the... I think I someone is... Uh... <laughs> well, if somebody really... But here's what I sent. Here's the, here's the, um, email, the text I sent to a group of my neighbors. Who wants pie tonight? I'm doing a live baking demo, and I'm going to have lots of pies that will need home. So um, I'm doing little pie samplers and I'm going to be the pie fairy dropping them off at my neighbors. Oh, that sounds wonderful. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, I think I'm some people are disappointed people. maybe. Some people are disappointed. Well, I'm, I'm, you, I'm an easy touch. So if you're really dying for a pie, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> Careful what you're saying. There are 22 people here. I love, I love where I live. We live in Darby Town, which is on the Literally, I guess historically the wrong side of the track because we're on the other side of the train station from downtown. And we have such a wonderful blend of people that live here, old, young, different races, different religions, different backgrounds. It's just, it's wonderful. And we really have a very tight community here. We're really lucky. That's great. Yeah, wonderful to hear. But thank you so much. Uh, okay, You're here's someone who says, I'm close to Darby Town. Does that make me a neighbor? Somebody is really pleading here. <laughs> well, I know, we you'll tell them. Oh, Adam, we've done so many food um, uh, um, farmers markets together that you know if you hit me up, I will make you a pie. <laughs> Just tell me what kind you want. And for you vegans, I know if you want to um, try one of my experiments, let me know and I will know who to tested on. <laughs> and, just, Gloria. and just so you know, it's a big thank you uh, for all your stories as well. Oh. Well, some that, think that I makes have it a, richer. Yeah. That makes it richer. <laughs> but thank you for letting me share my family with you. I, I think you can probably tell how much they all mean to me. And you know what they've given me through, you know, all the memories of making stuff with my grandmothers and my aunts and you know, yeah. from the earliest days at, you know, climbing up on the stool to try to help and trying to pass that along to my kids. My favorite picture of my grandson, when he was about two, he covered himself in flour. He's just like <laughs> eyelids, everything. And I love that picture. I have it up on my, on my wall. Another one with the right DNA. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. He hasn't really started baking himself yet, but we'll see. Yeah. All right. Um, hold on. Let I'm me see if there's see anything kitty. else. Right, well, you hold on. Somebody wants to Someone see your wants... baby Gor Gorgie. I'll go. I'll go. Gorgie. It will take me a minute. Like, go upstairs and get him. He's been banished, but I'll be right back. All right. This is good. We do have seven more minutes <laughs> from the pies to the dogs. This is Cecil, the great sweet potato hunting corgi. Can you say hi, Cecil? Can you say hi? <laughs> Can you say hi? Some dogs hunt truffles, mine hunt sweet potato. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. He's a good boy. Yeah. A little thank crazy. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
And I am sure that there will be a, a lot of pie baking this holiday. Uh, and again, to everybody, the uh, recipes will be on posted on uh, the Fredericksburg Food Co-op uh, Facebook page. And um, any questions? Um, Let me try to show you that that crazy la that cheater lattice. It's not quite done, but close. So that's how it looks coming out of the oven. It's still, whoops, juice. Can't tilt it too much, but it gives the lattice effect, but a little less formal. So right. Still needs it. No, it looks beautiful. And that, my friends, is fine. <laughs> what a beautiful ending. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Rich. Great job. Thanks, guys.